Um, but tonight I wanted to talk about vision and, and, um, and how we, we don't want to go blind, I suppose. And so I've entitled this message, I Spy. Now, I don't know if you've ever played I Spy. Maybe some of our young people haven't because it's often a car game that you play. And we kind of played this before we had DVDs in the car. We didn't really have that when we were growing up. Um, We used to make long road trips down uh, to New South Wales to see my my mum's family. And um, my dad loves driving to New South Wales, which was great because we got there. But he didn't really like stopping, which is... uh, that's fine. So we would stop for like breakfast, we'd stop for lunch, but then nowhere in between would we stop. We'd just go straight through. So you had to go to the bathroom when we'd stopped, otherwise you'd be holding on for a really long time. Um, So I remember one time we were, you know, we were in the car and um, we'd just gotten out for lunch and my mum being a good mum was like, has everyone gone to the toilet that needs to go to the toilet? And I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm so good, I don't need to go. And then as soon as dad took off, it was like, oh, I gotta go. (laughs) Oh no. So then the whole way, you're just like, you're trying to take your mind off it. You're trying to not think about the fact that you really are busting to go to the bathroom. I got there, it was fine. No accidents happened. We were all good. Um, but the things that you do, so we used to have like a, um, a cassette that was play school that we used to put in like the tape player. And that would like go on and on and on. Yeah, I'm now being an adult, I have so much compassion for my parents because that would have been horrible. But they let it go on and on and on, which I'm so thankful for. I'm so thankful for. But another thing you do is you play I Spy uh, in the car. You play I Spy. So I don't know if you know, you go, I, um, uh, um, what do you say? I Spy. Ah, I spy with my little eyes something starting with, and you often start with, so the first person often starts with C, which is like cars, because you can spy cars. And and then you move on to like T for trees, because that's often a thing. And someone might say like R for road, which is another thing that you spy. Um, I've recently played this again with my nieces and nephews, and it's been a bit tricky because I've realised that sometimes kids say things that they can't even see. So, like, E is for the Princess Elsa. Like, of course. Of course that's what it is for. And, like... um, they, they say all these things. So that kind of increases the skill level of I Spy when you start saying things you can't see, but that's fun. But unless you're my niece or nephew, if you're playing I Spy, it's to do with things that you can see. It's to do with things that are in your vision. The things that are in front of you, that's what you're playing the game for. And so tonight we're going to talk about vision. Um, and before we get into the Word of God, we're actually going to just quickly have a look at the eye and how the eye works. I know you didn't come to church tonight thinking that you were going to jump back into grade eight, bi- grade eight biology, but here we are. Um, so up on the screen is going to come a picture of an eyeball. So you can see that there's a leaf there um, outside of the eye that the eye is looking at. So what happens when you see is uh, some light reflects from the leaf into through your cornea and your pupil um, and actually hits the back of your um, retina at the back there. You can see the leaf is upside down. That's because that light has reflected there. Then your retina is actually really clever. It has all these millions of cells that turn that vision, turn that light reflection um, into an electrical impulse. And that electrical impulse goes down your optic nerve to your brain. And your brain is what actually translates what you see into being something that you see, which is pretty awesome. I think that's really cool. So it's actually your brain that when you see a dog says, hey, I've seen a dog, which is awesome. Um, So your brain is really clever at that. And... And there's a difference between your eyes being able to reflect. So your eyes, what they do is they reflect light, but your brain translates that reflection into actually an image. And we're going to practice this right now. So an image is going to come up on the screen and and we're all going to see the same image, but different people are going to see different pictures in the image. So I want you to look at the image and as you see it, you're going to see a different picture. And remember what that was because we're going to have a look at this. So Julie, if you want to pop that picture on the screen, everyone can have a look. Give you a moment to look at it. Okay, who first saw a man's face? So some of us. Who first saw a boy painting um, a picture of two houses? A couple of us, a couple of us. 
So we all had the same content. We all had the same picture, image, but we all, each of us may have actually seen different pictures. Can everyone see the face now and, and the little boy painting pictures? It's a pretty clever little picture. It's a pretty clever little picture. So our eye is really important. And so tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about... Um, I'm going to talk about Jesus and when He steps into a place where someone is blind and actually heals them. So there's three major accounts of this happening in the Bible and we're actually going to look through each of those and have a, have a bit of a look, which is um, going to be awesome. So, but before we get into that, I love reading research and I totally appreciate that I might be in the minority here in this group, and that's okay. Um, so if you're, if you're with me, so just hang in with me because I've got a point to this. Um, I love reading research, and as I was actually researching this message tonight, I came across something that just made me go, wow, wow. So hold on with me because we're going we're gonna to get to a point. So... In 2005, there was a group of people um, who published an article in an ophthalmology journal, uh, and they were written by people from Lebanon, New York, um, and Germany, and it was about the ocular miracles of Jesus. That just means um, when Jesus healed the blind. So it was about this. So this was in 2005, and their goal was to appraise and criticise, um, to, to analyse the optical miracles Jesus performed formed in his ministry years. And they looked at their miracles from a medical, from a spiritual and a cultural point of view. Um, and they came to a conclusion. And if we could have that article just up on the screen, you can see here the conclusion they came to was that the miracles were historically accurate which is pretty cool, which is pretty cool. So they looked at these miracles, um, they appraised them, and then they came to this conclusion that these miracles were historically accurate um, and they were relevant. And the thing about that that I want to just talk to you tonight is that in 2,000 years after Jesus performed these miracles, 2,000 years, they were put under scrutiny. They were put under scrutiny by people who appraised them, who looked at them. Um, and what they came to, they came to this conclusion that it is still relevant for today, that it is historically accurate, that, that it, it passed the test. And, and the thing I love about this is that our society so often actually separates science and God and says science is apart from God and the two cannot correlate. They can't be in the same room together. But I believe that God, the creator of the universe, made science, that He speaks to science, that, that His Word of God, um, His Word of God um, acknowledges science and, and they co they co relate, they correlate, which is so amazing. So, you know, the scriptures we're about to read tonight, they weren't just nice stories that were written 2,000 years ago, but they are relevant for us today. They are relevant for us today, right here, right now. And God is good. So the first miracle we're going to look at is in John 9, 1 to 9. And it's in the, um, so this, the scriptures up on the screen are going to be in the New Living Translation tonight. Um, so if you want to flip there in your Bibles, otherwise you can just follow along on the screen. We're going to read that. And this first miracle, the cool thing about this miracle is that this is the only one where the man um, who's receiving um, the healing from his blindness was actually born blind which is awesome. So we're just going to read that right now. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked, why has this man been born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must click quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and, and then no one can work. But while I am here, I am the light of the world. Then he did this weird thing. He spit on the ground, made mud with saliva and spread the mud across the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So, man, so the man went and washed and came back seeing. 
And the really thing, cool thing about him coming back seeing is that word seeing actually meant that he could see. Now, for someone that's been born blind, to be able to see then, you've got to learn some things. You've got to learn like distance. You've got to learn colour. You've got to learn like where things are. So, so this, this was like a miracle of twofold, that he not only received sight, but he was able to put that sight into practice really, really quickly, which is awesome, which is so, so cool. So just a quick facts about blind people in this, um, in this time. So blindness kind of disqualified you from earning an income just because you couldn't work. So you weren't able to get an income, you weren't able to work. It also disqualified you from entering the temple to worship, which was not only like a spiritual thing to be able to come into that, but that was part of the community. So you couldn't participate in the community. You couldn't be a part of that. And if you were blind, you were part of the oppressed and the exploited because it was really easy to exploit the people that were blind. And Pastor Julie preached an awesome message on that a little while ago. Um, But that's just, yeah, so it was really easy to exploit you. Um, Now, interestingly, um, what I want to focus on here is that Jesus' disciples asked this question. Was it his sins or his parents' sins that made him blind? And now for us today, if someone was born blind, we probably, that's not the first thing that we would think about. That's not something that would come to mind. So I just want to explain this a little bit. And I think we can get some light on it when we look at Matthew 22 to 23. And this is Jesus talking in his teachings. He says, your eye is like a lamp that provides light to your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. And then Jesus goes on to actually discuss about wealth and to talk about how we should be generous with our money and how we should um, not be stingy with our money. You see, in Jewish culture, the eye was a very important symbol. You see, if the eye was full of light, it was a symbol for the whole body being full of light. And if the eye was full of darkness, it was a symbol of the whole body being full of darkness. And this extended to how you treated people and your relationship with money. So how you actually, um, so if I said Pastor Joe was full of light, I would be saying he's really generous. So he's really kind and he gives money to the poor and he he cares for the poor. Um, So in this, their concept of the eye was that if your eye was not good, then your whole body was not good. So it was either full of sin or full of darkness or something had happened. So there was this kind of spiritual nature. Um, so they recognised that the eye reflected only what was already there. And as we looked at the picture before of the eye, we saw that the eye actually reflected the light. So it reflected this light. So, so we know that the eye reflects only what is already there, like an object or, or it, it just reflects whatever, or what was already there. And so that was their perception of this. But then Jesus steps in and actually changes their perception. And He says this really powerful thing. He says, I am the light of the world. Now, there's a lot of power in this statement because what He is saying is that that your eye can't make you whole, that, that your doing can't make you whole, but it is only by the grace of God, it is only by Jesus Christ that we are made whole, which is amazing because not only did it speak to this blind man, but it speaks to us today in that if we are filled with Jesus, um, our whole body is full of Jesus. So we can't just have part of Him, we get all of Him. So all of us is whole. So when we step into God's presence, you know, no matter what's happened in the past, if we are filled with Jesus Christ, which if you're a Christian, you are, then if, as we step into His presence, all of us is full of light. So, so we can have a boldness about that. We can say, God, you know, because of You, I am full of light, which is also amazing because there is nothing that we can do to separate us from the presence of God. There's nothing that we can do personally that would separate from us from His light because He is the light of the world. It's all because of Him. It's all because of Him. And I really feel that as we enter this new season at Emerge, I really feel that we're actually stepping into a season where signs and wonders are going to follow us, which is amazing. And I believe that we will see healings. And I believe that we will see mental illness healed and we will see these things happen. But we need to recognise that's because of Jesus. There's nothing that we do that that facilitates that, but we are just vessels of His light. We're just vessels of His light. We just reflect His light, that He is God and He is good. 
And, and I love this scripture because he actually, it says that the people around the blind man didn't even recognise him after he had been healed. And how cool would it be if there were people that came in here that used to come, that maybe fell away and then came back and had a radical revelation that Jesus Christ was Lord and they were fully transformed and we didn't even recognise them because he had done so much to change their countenance, to change the way they walked to change the way they talked. And that's our Jesus. That is our Jesus. God alone, He is the light of the world who takes away our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Let's jump on to miracle two. And I love this miracle because um, this is um, blind Bartimaeus and we find this scripture in Mark 10, 46 to 52, but it's also in Matthew 9, 27 to 31. If you're taking notes and and you want that, it's there as well. But we're gonna read it from Mark. So Mark... um, 9.46, we read this. Then they reached Jericho and as Jesus, his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people around him yelled. But then he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stood and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asks. And then Bartimaeus said, my rabbi, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. I love this verse. I love this verse. You see, Bartimaeus, he was a man of faith. He walked by, he walked by faith. He might have been blind naturally, but spiritually he walked by faith. So as Jesus was walking along the road, he recognised who Jesus was. He recognised his royalty. He recognised his divinity. He recognised who was standing in front of them, though he could not see. He recognised who was standing in front of him and he called out, he called out by faith that he would be healed. And even when, even when God, called, uh, when Jesus called him, he threw off his cloak, his security, his safety and ran before the healing had taken place. He ran at Jesus' first prompt. And I love this faith that Bartimaeus has. You see, the people around him, they were full of sight, but they couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't see Jesus. And to the point that they tried to silence the one who had faith. They tried to silence Him. And and I wonder if, so I wonder if for us, as we walk by faith, not by sight, if there are voices for us that try to silence us, that, that that try to crowd us in, that try to speak negativity into our lives. But as we walk by faith, you see Bartimaeus, as he called out to Jesus, that opened the door for God to work a miracle for him. And as we walk by faith, that opens the door for God to step in and to move like only God can. But if we walk by sight, we are hindered by what we can see. We are hindered by what's in front of us. We can hindered by what we can see. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith and not by sight in Jesus' name. Um, so those around blind Bartimaeus were telling him to keep quiet, to keep silent, um, but he didn't. He only shouted louder. When we walk by our reflection of what's happening, we are limited by our perceptions and we silence the voice of God. When I was in university, I was in second year university um, and, and I was studying nursing which is awesome because that's, I am a nurse, so it worked out well. You've got the ending of the story already. Um, but while I was studying nursing in second year, they say first year's the hardest. I found second year the hardest. I actually failed two subjects in the second year of uni, which wasn't a fun time for me. And in that moment, I was full of like, woe is me. Like, God, what are you doing? I thought this is what you call me to. And, and, and I'm just struggling with failure now. And, and, and I'd had the results right in front of me, but I didn't see what God was doing in the future. You see, that meant I had to drop down to two subjects each semester. And and fast forward eight months, um, my boyfriend at the time, now husband Kyle, um, he actually went into hospital and got really sick. Uh, which isn't good, but but then he had an operation and, and he had a long road to recovery. 
But in that season, I realised that, that God had kind of orchestrated things so that I could actually carry the weight of what I needed to do, still pass university, uh, work a part-time job um, and, and, and help Kyle kind of through this time, which was really difficult in that season. You see, I believe God was working, that though I failed two subjects and that was horrible at that time, that, that God was actually doing something for the future to support me in the future. And, and that's kind of what hindsight does. It gives you the bigger picture of what God God's doing. Um, and interestingly, actually, um, when Kyle went into hospital and, and that wasn't a fun time for us, Pastor Mark, we ran, um, there was like a leaders meeting and Pastor Mark asked me to speak about God is good. And, and, and that, was, that was a funny thing because I was like, God, I feel like you're laughing at me because right now my life isn't what appears to be good. But I, I was able to stand there and say, God is good. And I, to this day, believe God is good. Because I don't walk by sight. I don't walk by what's right in front of me. I don't want to walk by what's happening right here, right now. I believe our God is good and that He works all things for His good and His glory and that He is working things for us right now for His glory. And so when you have this walk by faith, not by sight, you can stand there in the middle of the storm and say, God, I know You are good. I know You are worthy. I know healing is coming. I know restoration is coming. I might not see it right here, right now. Now, but I can see it in here. I can see it in here because I know that you are good and that you have ultimate victory. That is what walking by faith means. That is what walking by faith means. As we walk by faith, we allow God opportunity to do what only He can do, only what He can do. It opens up a place for God to work His plans and drowns out the voices of ourselves and the world. It is by His faith that Bartimaeus was healed. There's this really cool thing that, um, that happened when the disciples were actually in the middle of a storm. So the sea was raging and they were in the middle of the storm. They were on a boat and they were, they were terrified as I'm sure every single one of us would have been. Um, and Jesus, uh, they wake up Jesus and say, you know, what are you gonna do about this? And Jesus just turns to them and says, where is your faith? Because it is by that faith that God is able to work for us. And I don't know about you, but in a storm, I would much rather be with Jesus than anywhere else in the world because He is so good. So walk by faith, not by sight. The final miracle we're gonna look at tonight is in Mark 8, 22, 26. And it's entitled, Jesus Heals a Blind Man. When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, can, anyone, can you see anything now? The man, looked, the man looked around and said, yes, he said. I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around which for us means that he has a bit of a reference. So he definitely wasn't born blind there. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes and his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored and he could see everything clearly. Jesus sent him away saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. So this man received his sight, which is so incredible and so amazing. But what I love about this scripture is that nowhere in the scripture does it mention this man's faith. So we've just kind of learnt about Jesus is the light of the world. It is through Him by miracles happen. And as we have faith, um, we, like our faith opens the door for God to do things. But nowhere in this Scripture does it mention this man's faith. Nowhere in this Scripture does it mention him kind of begging Jesus, going, Jesus, I really want this miracle. What it does mention is that some people brought him to Jesus and they begged to, for this man to receive his sight. And I love that because for us in this, in this environment, it means that we can have faith for people, that we can have faith for people. And, and I'm sure because of the things we talked about this before, that, that blind men were oppressed and they were, they were kind of exploited and, and they didn't have employment and, and they, weren't, they weren't very... I'm, I'm sure that he probably didn't look like um, the cool people to hang around or the people that they, ins, they aspired to be like. And, I, and I'm sure he might not have even smelled like something that someone that they wanted to be around. But in this, the only thing mentioned is that 
that some people brought him to Jesus and begged Jesus for him to be healed. And, and I wonder for us, is there people in our life that God wants us to carry the weight for? Maybe they had to carry this man to Jesus. Maybe they had to actually pick him up and, and carry him carry him because they, he couldn't walk. I don't know. But what I do know is that they carried the weight of, of, of getting him into the presence of Jesus, to getting him into the place where he could have an encounter with Jesus and have his miracle. And, and we've got Discover coming up. And I wonder if there are people in our lives that we can carry the weight to get them into a place where they're in the presence of Jesus. Because we know in that place, their lives will be changed. Their eyes will be opened spiritually and naturally that God God is doing a new thing and that we have the responsibility to carry the weight for those around us, to get them into the presence of Jesus. What do you see? What do you see? I, I want you to close your eyes if you feel comfortable right now. And if you don't, just, just you can look at your, you can look in at your hands in your lap if, if that's what you feel comfortable with. But I think each and every one of us have someone who we perceive to be so far from God, to be the furthest from God, who we perceive to be someone who is not, like not even near God, but is so far away from God that, that it, it, they can't even come into the kingdom. Well, I want you to just focus on them right now. And I wonder if we might pray for them right now because I believe that God is doing a new thing and He wants to draw them into His kingdom. So we're gonna pray for them right now. God, we just pray for these people who seem so far from You, who seem so helpless and so uh, far away from You, but we thank You that You love them, that You are drawing them into Your kingdom. God, that You have a place for them here in Your presence, in Your kingdom of God. And God, we thank You that You love them and that they are called to be sons and daughters of You. And we pray for them right now that You would just touch them, that You would um, make, the, make a way that they would be in, to able to encounter You and that You would fill us with the courage to speak about Your goodness and Your grace in their lives, we pray. In Jesus' Name, Amen. 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 No, can I encourage you, church? No one is too far from God. No one is too far from God. Everyone is one moment away from encountering His presence. From one moment away from encountering His presence. I want to invite the band up. We've talked a lot tonight about God doing miracles with eyes. And, and there's another place where Jesus does a miracle um, with eyes, but it's actually that it takes away sight. And um, I, I love this story because I think it's amazing. There's this guy called Saul, um, and he was actually, he was... He was just into persecuting Christians to the point that in Acts, I think it's chapter nine, it says he was eager to persecute and kill Christians. You know you're in a bad place where you're eager to persecute and kill Christians. So he was in this place and he was actually on the road to Damascus and he was heading to actually um, kill more Christians and persecute them and, and ensure that they couldn't do what they were doing anymore. And, and on this road to Damascus, Jesus um, has a moment with him and stops him in his tracks and he has an encounter with Jesus. And as he has an encounter with Jesus, his vision is actually taken away. Um, but as his vision is taken away, Jesus does this beautiful exchange where he exchanges destruction for forgiveness, where he exchanges hopelessness for hope, where he exchanges a, a life of wrongdoings for a life of following Jesus and pursuing Jesus and, and calling to the lost. And, and it's this incredible encounter. And then three days later, a guy named Ananias comes and lays hands on Saul and he receives his vision. And this guy, he, he is so incredible because he goes from a life of eagerly wanting to persecute and kill Christians to a life that he just lives for Jesus. He just lives every moment for Jesus. And later on, we find out Saul is called Paul and he is the, the biggest contributor to the New Testament that we have. And, and he is the actually one that penned these words, for we walk by faith, not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And I love this because he lived that. He lived that. He, he, he knew what it was to walk by faith, not by sight. He knew that as Jesus entered the room, it didn't matter what circumstance you were in. It didn't matter what was happening around you. As Jesus steps into the room, nothing is impossible because He, through all things, it is possible through Jesus. 
can we have faith for ourselves? Can we have faith for those around us? You see, ultimately Jesus is the scene of what God has already done. In Colossians 1.15, it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. While we were still blind, while we were still lost in our sin, Christ died for us. He loved us enough. While we were still lost in our sin, Christ died for us.